Okay, good morning. In the last lecture, I uh, did a little demonstration for you where I showed you the uh, showed you a pair of inverters and showed you that the uh, inverter that uh, the output of the first inverter looked weird um, certainly not like anything we've seen thus far it looked like uh, a slow rising transition like this and using that motivation we had begun our study of RC circuits and in particular Oh, for today, uh, the lecture's titled So we'll look, we're going to look at uh, the fundamentals of uh, digital circuit speed, and it all boils down to an RC delay. Okay, by the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you two numbers that you can look at a circuit and obtain by observation multiply them out, and you'll get a good idea of the speed uh, at which a circuit will run. It's pretty amazing. OK, so as a quick review, and uh, the relevant section for this is uh, chapter 10.4. So as a review, we said uh, to understand things like this, we need to develop the foundations for RC circuits. And uh, the example I covered was that of a very simple circuit that looked like this, an RC circuit of this form. And uh, I also showed you that for for an input of the form. input that steps from 0 to vi at uh, time t equal to 0. And assuming that the capacitor state at time t equal 0 was 0. So what this means is that the capacitor starts from rest. So at time t equal to 0, the capacitor, oops, this is uh, vi, I'm sorry. So uh, we assume that the capacitor starts from rest. At time t equal to 0, I apply a vi step capital VI, and then I want to look at how the voltage across the capacitor behaves. And uh, we did a bunch of analysis, and at the end of the day, in the final demo in the lecture last time, I showed you that the capacitor would behave like this. It would start off at, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, this should be, Let's assume this started off at V0. Okay, we get a different equation for zero. So let's say the capacitor started off at V0, in which case Vc at time t equal to zero is uh, V0 as expected. And we showed that the output would look something like this. At, uh, after a long period of time, this would come up to Vi. And this rise had a time constant of tau equals RC. So um, we wrote the equation for this waveform. And uh, this is the case when VI is greater than VO. Okay? Um, I'd like you to stare at the circuit and this result here to uh, get more intuition on what's going on. So at times t0, VC starts up at zero as expected, uh, at V0 as expected. Okay, because I'm telling you that that's the case. That's the initial condition. Starts up at V0. Then uh, this one steps to VI. Okay, there is no infinite transition anywhere here. And so the capacitor holds its voltage at v V0 at time t equals 0. And then the VI here, which is greater than V0, begins to charge the capacitor up. Okay, charge it through this resistor. And so therefore, the capacitor charges up. After a long period of time, from a basic foundation of capacitors, we know that the capacitor appears like a long-term open circuit to DC. Okay, this is a DC voltage VI. 
So it appears like an open circuit. So after a long period of time, VI appears at the end. And from here to here, I have an exponential rise that is typified by an equation of the form minus T by RC. Okay? Uh, this kind of waveform, rising from a smaller value to a higher value, is typified by this expression. Okay? We saw that expression when we developed the equations the last time. On the other hand, if VI, if the input was such that VI was smaller than VO, so let's say uh, VI was smaller than VO, then what would happen is that the capacitor voltage would start off at V0 because I'm telling you that's the initial condition and would then decay in this manner to the final value of VI, which is the input. So instead of going up this way, it decays down to the final value applied to the circuit. Uh, again, the time constant is RC. But this is typified by a form. Okay, this is exponential rise, and this guy, e to the minus t by rc, is an exponential decay. So the key thing to remember is that when you have rc circuits of this form, the waveforms that you get are either minus t by e to the minus t by rc or one minus e to the minus t by rc. Okay, so uh, you can now begin to see how waveforms such as that come about. We will do an example and sit down and compute the inverter delay. And uh, notice that this waveform here is very typical or corresponds to this waveform that we see here. OK, here I'm starting at V0. And assuming this axis uh, starts off at 0, this one starts very close to 0 and then rises up to some, uh, some final value. OK. So this is, uh, so far I've reviewed some material from you, uh, for you that uh, I covered the last time. Um, as a second step, I'd like to give you a much more intuitive approach. That doesn't involve solving any differential equations, OK? And, uh, and the reason I do this is that most experienced circuit designers do not sit down and write differential equations each time they see an RC circuit. OK? So uh, when you're starting out, you see an RC circuit, boom, 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 you say, ah, node method, and you write the differential equation. But uh -uh. experienced people don't do that. OK? They look at it, and they can sketch the waveform out by inspection. And I'll show you how to do that. It is indeed incredibly simple once I give you some intuition. Um, throughout the rest of this course, I will be showing you many such examples where initially I developed the foundations of stuff and then show you an in intuitive approach that very quickly lets you either get the final answer or at least sanity check the answer that you've gotten. And uh, but this is how experienced circuit designers uh, deal with stuff. So how many people here have seen uh, this movie, Bend It Like Beckham? So, you know, uh, uh, this Beckham character doesn't think about how he's going to curve the ball. You know, he just, he just does it, and it happens. Okay, he doesn't sit down writing, you know, differential equations to find out, you know, the projectile uh, 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 trajectory and all of that stuff. You just kind of do it. And so, uh, so I'd like to, uh, uh, this series of intuitions I'm going to give you uh, is going to be uh, in line with uh, the bend it like Beckham kinds of intuition. Okay? And uh, this one in particular, I'd like to do in honor of uh, one of your recitation instructors, uh, Professor David Perrault. Okay, and so this piece of intuition uh, is going to be termed practice it like Perrault. Okay, watch what I do with the other names. So, uh, <coughs> so, professor, so Professor David Perrault uh, is a world is really a world expert in designing really incredible power supplies for very, very small chips and so on, okay? So he doesn't write differential equations to do this stuff. He looks at it and, you know, sketches it out. So let me show you how he would do this, okay? So suppose I have my circuit like before, VI, R and C, okay? And I'm telling you that uh, VC of 0 is V0, 
and my input bi is a step that looks like this. vi is a step. Okay? So um, how would Professor Perrault do this? Okay, let's do it completely by intuition. Okay, no math here. All right, so we know that uh, I've told you that uh, this guy starts off at V0. I'm telling you that, so you know. Hey. You know it's going to start at V0. Okay, and there is no uh, uh, impulse or huge infinite transition, and so uh, the capacitor starts off at uh, V0. We also know from basic capacitor properties that after a long period of time in the steady state, this is but a DC voltage. Like if I apply a DC, okay, and here's my capacitor, after a long period of time, this guy is going to look like an open circuit. Like it's going to charge up to some value, and then it's going to look like an open circuit. Okay? Um, because if it didn't, uh, you would keep charging it, and its voltage would keep uh, increasing. Okay, that doesn't happen. It looks like an open circuit. So if it looks like an open circuit in the long run, it's vol the voltage across it must be capital VI. Okay, so if uh, I don't have current flowing in the circuit, then the only way that can happen is this open circuit, so capital VI appears across the capacitor. Well, so after a long period of time, I know that the output must look like this. Okay, uh, in this case, I've assumed VI is greater than VO. So you've got two points of your curve, V0 and VI after a long period of time. Okay, and as I told you uh, earlier, with capacitors, you get two kinds of curves, chuk or chuk, right? Two things. So what you do is go, you go zoop, there you go, you're done. Okay, and uh, uh, this has an exponential rise. This is of the form 1 minus e to the minus uh, uh, rc. So we can write down the equation for that as follows. So vc is, we know that there is something to do with minus T by RC. Okay, this is of that form. So there has to be that term in there somewhere. Okay? And no, I start off at V0. So at time t equal to zero, at time t zero, this is one and this is one, so this term becomes a zero. Okay? So at time t zero, that becomes a zero, so I get V0 here. Okay, the, I, I'm going to make sure this stuff stays zero at time t equal to zero. Okay, so I start off at V0. Now, as time wears on, what happens here? This voltage here, Vi minus V0. Okay, if you look at this difference, that, that is exponentially decaying over time. And so therefore, all I have to do here is write Vi minus V0. There's the answer. Okay, I'm just, I know the, the form of the curve. I'm just fitting an expression that meets this form. Okay, so this starts off at V0. When time t is zero, this, this second expression is zero, and so it's V0, okay? And this difference here, this difference decays down to zero, okay? And this difference here, Vi minus V0, is multiplied by this term here, and uh, that's what I get. And you can confirm this. At time t equal to zero, this is zero. At time t infinity, this goes to zero. This goes to zero, leaving a one. And V0 and minus V0 cancel, and I get a VI. Okay, virtually any such simple voltage source, current source, resistor, capacitor circuit for most inputs like steps and so on can be analyzed in this manner. Okay, initial, initial value, final value, chuk. Okay, it's simple. Okay, and, and just to show you that this is simple, I'm going to label this expression this way. It's, it's of the form. 1 minus e to the minus t by rc. Just remember that. Now, by the same token, what if vi had been smaller than v0? Then, that's simple too. I would have had my vi being here. vi would have been here. And that's of the form. In this particular situation, here's my vi, my starting value, and I do this. Okay, and just to label that, let me label that this way. Okay, I just told you that for RC circuits, you go this way or you go this way. Okay, so it's down here. 
So I get some kind of an exponential decay. Okay? And like before, <coughs> think of this one. This one has vi as a base value here. And the difference between the two is vo minus vi. Okay? And that difference decays. So I have a vi out here. And this difference decays. So I get vo minus vi. And that decays in this form. OK? So I get an exponential decay of this difference here. OK? Just stare at it for a while longer. And you should be able to uh, just go and knock it off just like this. OK? Just like Professor Perrault would. Boom. OK? No differential equations. Just write it down by looking at the curve. <clears throat> so uh, let's keep these two in mind, these two forms. OK? Uh, one is the uh, 1 minus e to the minus t by rc form and the e to the minus t form. Okay, both have a time constant um, RC. So, uh, so this is for, oh, let me just uh, make this a dashed line just to be the safe side here. Okay. So that's our first piece of intuition. And uh, as I pointed out before, um, in problems you face in life or in ones that we give you, feel free to use the intuitive method, okay? And, uh, or what you can do is apply the mathematical method and then check your answer by using your intuition. Okay. So now what I'd like to do next is apply what we've learned so far to figure out what we set out to figure out, which is the delay of my inverter, okay? I promised you that by the end of this lecture, I was going to close the loop on that little demo. Okay, I was going to close the loop for you on this little circuit that we had looked at, one inverter driving another inverter. This was A, uh, this was inverter X, and this was uh, my node B. But the middle, the green curve you see out there, the middle one, has a transition shown up there. And what I'm going to do next is use the results we've gotten so far to compute a number. We're going to compute a delay number, both for a rising transition. We'll call the delay uh, dr for rising transition. And we'll compute a delay for the falling transition, df. Remember, when I remember that this is the input that falls down sharply. The intermediate node b rises much more slowly. And because this rises much more slowly, this guy here falls a little after this transition here. And so there is a delay. OK? And uh, I'm going to apply what we've learned so far and do an example for you and figure out what that delay is. OK? This is a very, this is, this is an absolutely foundational calculation done in building digital circuits all the time. OK? It's remarkable that something so simple is used in designing even the most complex of circuits to obtain very quick ideas of what my delay will look like when I have some sub-circuit driving some other piece of sub-circuit. So uh, let me just draw a few uh, equivalent circuits for you. The internal circuit looks like this. This is my inverter X, A, my node B. I notice that uh, I have this capacitor C, G, S. Uh, since I'm interested in this node, uh, let me show you that this capacitor explicitly. It's because of this capacitor here uh, that uh, arises because of this MOSFET here between the gate and the source. And that capacitor gives rise to this RC thing that we're seeing. Uh, this is RL, this is RL, V, S, V, S. OK? And let's say, uh, just as up there, at time uh, t equal to 0, I get a transition like so, a falling transition from, say, 5 volts to 0 volts at uh, the node A. OK, this is VA here. That's shown up there. And VB.
So we had expected that VB would look like this. We expected VB to be instantaneous and looking like that. But instead, because of the capacitor, VB looks like this. OK, remember, again, this is of the form 1 minus e to the minus rc. OK, we'll write down the answers by uh, inspection. So um, from this, let me draw the connection to circuit delay by showing you another little graph here, T, VB, OK, to 0. And what I'm going to show you, let's say this is 5 volts. And so the output goes like this from 0 to 5, uh, from close to 0 to 5 volts. OK, it's close to 0 because uh, um, at least with the inverters we've been seeing in uh, lab and so on, the R on for the inverter is very, very small compared to RL. OK, so it's uh, virtually 0 down here. And so what's the... Delay. I mentioned there are two delays of interest. One is the rising delay. That is the logical value at the end of, if I wait a long enough period of time, is a logical one. Okay? Delay is simply defined as starting from here. Okay? How long does this output take to get to a valid one? Okay? So at what voltage here? At what voltage here can I say that this transition corresponds to a logical one? At what voltage here can I say that that represents a valid one? Any ideas? Yes. Depends on the discipline. Bingo. So it depends on the discipline. Okay, now let's get more specific. Okay, since it depends on the discipline, at what value, based on something in the discipline, uh, can I say this thing is a logical one? This is an output, remember. VOH. Bingo. There's some VOH somewhere, and it takes some amount of time to get to a valid logical one output. There we go. <laughs> There's a delay. This is TR, and I call this the rising, rising delay of the inverter X. It is interesting that the rising delay of inverter X, based on our model, depends on the parameters of this inverter and the parameters of whatever it is driving. Okay, so remember that the delay is not necessarily just a property of the inverter itself, but it depends, of in the con depends on the context. So if I stick my inverter before another inverter like this, it's a capacitance on that inverter by our model that tells me what the delay is going to look like, of course, in addition to RL. And we'll do the math in a, few, uh, in a few seconds. By the same token, if I had this wire connecting not to one inverter, but going to 10 other inverters, I expect to have a capacitance equal to 10 times CG, CGS. And so therefore, this thing should rise even more slowly, correct? Okay, the more capacitance on here, the slower it rises up. Simple. So if I put uh, more and more load on this line by putting more and more capacitors, uh, more and more MOSFETs on that line, more and more inverters, this will rise slower. In our example, I have just one. So let's go ahead and compute uh, the delay. So this is called the rising delay of X. That says that for this node here to go from a valid, from its output value to a valid one, which is VOH, how long does it take? Notice if this capacitor was zero, if this cap was zero, then you would have seen an instantaneous transition. And if you saw an instantaneous transition, then notice that the delay, the rising delay was zero. That was the, the model we had looked at up to we learned about, up to learning about capacitors. Okay, so that's the delay. So let's go ahead and compute, uh, uh, compute the number. So I can draw an equivalent circuit for computing a rising delay. The equivalent circuit for the rising delay looks like the following. There's a VS voltage source, there's a resistor RL, and there's a capacitor CGS. Okay? Because uh, when I turn this uh, guy off, uh, this guy's gone off, and so as far as the rise time of this node is concerned, I can look at this circuit. Ground, through CGS, through RL, through VS, back to ground. 
Okay? And just for simplicity, let me draw this in a form that we understand. The CGS, let me use this as my ground node. And this is the voltage VB, and this is RL, and V is simply VS once that transition happens. So uh, by our equations here, uh, VI equals VS. And uh, what's VB0? VB0 is at what value does this node start out? Notice that uh, for simplicity here, if this R on is much, much smaller than RL, okay, then this node will be very close to ground. So I'll just go ahead and uh, say that VB at time t equal to zero is uh, approximately zero. Okay? And then what I want to find out is what does the value look like for, what does the value look like for time starting from zero and then uh, going forward? Well, we've become experts at this now. Okay, let's do the intuition here. Okay, start off at zero. Okay, that's good. Because my initial value is zero, so I start off here. What's the final value? After a long time, since this is a DC voltage, what will be the value at VB after a long time? Pardon? VS. Okay, so if I wait long enough, then it's going to look going to be at Vs. Aha! This is greater than the initial value, so we go done. Okay, that's why e to the minus 1 minus, that's 1 minus e to the minus t divided by rc form. Took me three seconds there. Okay, it's pretty cool. So, um, we could write the expression too. We could write the expression for this, and the expression was, I take my starting value, which is 0, and I've add to that this difference, Vs, and I multiply that by this form. There we go. And uh, remember, this I get this from, from that rising form, OK, up here. V0 is 0, this is 0, so it's simply Vi times that, and Vi is Vs. Okay, I really would like to like you to get this uh, intuition. Okay, um, if 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 you were given two, if I had two choices, one is that you understand the intuition and, and able to sketch that, versus you know in your sleep be able to solve the differential equation and get to the answer. I'd much rather you get the intuition. Okay, if it's if it's one or the other. Okay, so it's very simple. Start off at zero, I go chuck, and boom, I get to be yes, and this is my one minus e to the minus t by r c form. Okay. So uh, I need to compute TR, and TR is the time that this takes to get to VOH. Okay. So let me just run that. Up. So for what for what value of time for what T does VB reach VOH. Okay? So I want to find TR. So TR, what's TR? So the, from that equation, that simply tells me the trajectory of VB as a function of time. And so I need to find out what is T for which VB is VOH. So I write VOH equals Vs, 1 minus e to the minus t rise time by Rc. Okay, so after the rise time, my output is going to be VOH, and so let me go ahead and find uh, TR. Okay, so I, uh, let's see. I bring uh, this to this left-hand side, I move VOH, uh, I divide VOH by Vs, and then I move things around, and what I end up getting is minus TR, RC, and on the other side, I get okay. I divide VOH by VS. That's this. That's this. I move this to the other side, and move e to the minus t RC to this side, and take logarithms on both sides. This is what I get. 
Okay, so TR is therefore minus RLC GS ln 1 minus VOH by VS. That's my rice time. You can just do this by inspection. It's just so uh, awfully simple. So but just to give you some intuition at, uh, you know, uh, with numbers and so on, let's say that RL is 1K, uh, VS is 5 volts, VOH is 4 volts, CGS is 0 0.1 picofarads. Uh, this happens so often that we, don't, we, we oftentimes call it puff, okay, uh, 0.1 puff. Okay, it's picofarads, uh, uh, it's called puff. If it's nanofarads, uh, I, don't, I don't know why they didn't call it enough. They just call it nanofarads. Okay, so, um, so, TR, so TR for these numbers it gets to be 1 times 10 to the 3 times 0.1 times 10 to the minus 12 for picofarads, ln of 1 minus 4 by 5. Okay, and if you do the math, you get this down to 0.16 nanoseconds. This means that if I had an inverter like that, driving another inverter, then my output transition would be delayed by 0.16 nanoseconds. Okay, and trust me, uh, when Intel builds its microprocessors or when Broadcom builds its cable modem chips, okay, uh, they have to do this one way or the other, using a computer tool or by hand for virtually every little uh, sub-circuit in their big chip. Okay, that's how you get uh, uh, the delays, or some uh, you know, approximation thereof. Um, what I want you also to do is, for no particular reason, okay, I'll just compute for you the following quantity, RLCGS, the time constant of that circuit. Okay, for no reason at all. I'm just going to compute it and stick it here. Okay, and RLCGS, 1K times 1 picofarad is simply 0 0.1 nanoseconds. I'm just writing it and sticking it there for no particular reason. Okay. All right, uh, the next step, let's do uh, the falling delay. TF, okay, that's a rising delay, and although I didn't show this to you in the demo, there is a corresponding delay for the fall time. It doesn't fall instantly, but rather it falls rather slowly. So let's draw the equivalent circuit for when the node X falls. Notice that in my inverters here, this node starts off being at VS, okay? This is high. And this is going to fall because when I turn this transistor on, it's going to pull this node to ground, or it's going to fall down. And what's the equivalent circuit? The equivalent circuit is that ground through capacitor to this node. At this node, I have R on connecting to ground, and I have RL connecting to ground through VS. So let me draw that little circuit for you. Remember, life begins and ends on the storage elements, so I'll draw them first my storage element, CGS, that's VB, okay, and as I said, it goes from, this is a node X, it goes from R on to ground, and it also goes through RL, through VS, to ground, okay? And in this particular situation, VB of zero, for the falling delay, VB starts off at VS. So VB of zero is VS, okay? And the output, the final output, I'm not sure yet. What is the final value of the voltage at this node? Okay, I don't know that yet. I need to compute that. Okay, so what I'll do is whenever you see something like this, okay, uh, a capacitor connecting to linear stuff, okay, or a nonlinear element connecting to linear stuff, 
Okay, for no apparent reason, you should, you know, at least think about what? Think Thevenin, exactly. Okay, and, and then see if, you know, if you can use the Thevenin method to simplify your life. Okay, capacitor, a bunch of stuff here. I need to find out the initial value. Oh, I know that. That's, that's Vs. Done. I need to find the final value using my intuitive method. For the final value, I could do it just by looking at this, but, hey, I wanted to throw in Thevenin. So, hey, let me try the Thevenin equivalent and see if that makes my life any easier. So, uh, a VTH. Well, the Thevenin method says that you can replace this circuit here with a Thevenin equivalent of the sort for the purpose of determining what happens at uh, this node, given that that is linear. Okay, so I have, uh, so I need to find out that for the purpose of determining what happens at the node X, okay, um, I have to replace this with its Thevenin equivalent, and I now need to find out RTH and uh, VTH. So I get RTH by looking in here, okay, shorting this guy and looking at the resistance. So I look in like this. And then I short this guy here, okay, and I get RL in parallel with R on because this one shorts to ground. So RTH is simply RL in parallel with R on. Okay, this is a convenient notation for RL being in parallel with R on. And you all know the value of that. It's another one of our very simple patterns like voltage divider and so on. Resistance in, resistance in parallel uh, can be computed as RL R on divided by RL plus R on. What is VTH? VTH is the open circuit voltage here. Okay, so if I if I ignore this, if I take out this capacitor, I want to find out what the voltage here is. And aha, voltage divider. Okay, Vs, the voltage divider here, RL and R on. So I can write this down as Vs times R on divided by RL plus on. Remember, you will see again and again and again and again in 6002 or any circuit stuff that you do, you'll see them all over Thevenin, voltage dividers, current dividers, resistances in series, resistances in parallel, RC thing, uh, thingamajigs like this. Okay? So if you, if you just remember those 10 to 15 intuitive patterns, they are pretty much set for life. Okay? You know, it just comes on again and again and again. You know, parallel resistors, uh, voltage dividers. You should be able to write down a voltage divider, you know, in your sleep. Okay. So this is what I have. And uh, so let me now write down uh, intuitively what I expect the node X to do uh, just by, uh, by inspection. Okay, let's see. What is the initial value of the voltage across the capacitor? Intuitive method. Okay, this is how Professor Perot would do it, remember? So he would start off by saying, aha, initial value is Vs because I'm told it's Vs. Okay, start off at Vs, and so I start off here. What's the value after a long, long time based on this circuit here? V Thevenin. So after a long time, this is a DC voltage because that is a DC voltage. Capacitor looks like an open circuit after a long time, and VTH appears there, so it's simply V Thevenin. Okay? And then when you see those two, boy, I love doing this, you go like this. That's the coolest part. Okay, and uh, you know, I'm done. It's so simple. You know, three seconds or less, I'm able to tell you what the delay of a uh, inverter is, purely by intuition. Okay? Completely intuitively. I, mean, I haven't done any solving. It's just, it's just by observation. Took this circuit, okay, made my life easy, uh, Thevenin, looked at RTH, VTH, and then phew, sketched it by inspection. And again, if you, if you find, out, find that things are really, really very simple, you know, don't be surprised. Okay, once you get, the, get some conceptual understanding, things are indeed very simple. 
Okay, and you can eliminate a lot of math just by staring at things and attempting to build up the intuition. Okay, so uh, as the next step, what I can do is write down the expression for VB, and I write down the expression from a falling transition. So uh, how do I do it? Uh, what was it? Uh, VB. What was the method? I take the lowest value of interest here. That's uh, a VTH. Okay, and then I add to that this difference, decaying exponentially, and that difference is simply Vs minus VTH, and that decays exponentially. Okay, this form is the e to the minus t by RC form, and boom, I'm done. So many of you are wondering, so Professor Agarwal, if, if life was so simple, why on earth did you have us mess around with those differential equations uh, you know, to get here? You, know, you show us differential equations, and then you don't use them anymore. Well, that's a good question. Uh, the answer to that is that you, you need to understand the foundations. Okay? Once, you get, once you understand the foundations, you can find simplifying techniques to get to where you need to be. Okay, but you need to understand the foundations. Okay, you need to at least see in what, why things are the way they are at least once. Okay? Understand the foundations and then find intuitive ways of uh, uh, getting your answers. Okay, so now my falling delay here is I start off with BOS and I need to get all the way down to what value to compute my. So at some point here, This is a valid one. At some point, VB becomes a valid zero for the output. Okay? And that's when um, I stop my TF clock. So what, what, uh, what's the value here for this to be a valid zero? Don't all yell at once. VOL. Okay, so I simply have to figure out what is the value of time. This is page seven. What is the value of time for which this expression decays down to uh, VOL? So it's VTH plus VS minus VTH e to the minus TF by RC. Okay? So then I simplify this. How do I do that? I do VOL minus VTH. Okay? And then I divide that by Vs minus Vth, so VOL minus Vth, divide that by uh, Vs minus Vth, take logarithms on both sides, okay, and then multiply by RC, so I get Tf is minus, minus RC uh, uh, log of that. This is R Thevenin, and this is Cgs. How did I get this? VUL minus VTH divided by VS minus VTH. Take logs on both sides, okay? And then multiply throughout by minus one divided by uh, uh, minus RC. And I get my TF, done. So let's do it for the same numbers. For the same set of numbers. Uh, just that let me add an R on of uh, 10 ohms. Okay, I'll do, do this for R on of 10 ohms and uh, compute the value for you. So TF is minus RTH. Uh, RTH is R on parallel uh, uh, RL. This is 10 ohms. That's 1K. So 10 ohms in parallel with 1K is approximately 10 ohms. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, use approximately 10 ohms. Uh, one picofarad, one puff, that's RC, times uh, ln of VOL. Oh, I need to give you a VOL. So let's say my discipline has VOL being one volt. And so therefore, I end up getting uh, a VOL minus VTH divided by VS minus VTH. Okay? For since R on is much, much, much smaller than RL. Since R on is 10 ohms and this is 1K, 
most of Vs will drop across RL. Uh, this is 100 times smaller. So uh, compared to VOL, uh, which is one volt, uh, VTH is very, very small. Uh, VTH will be on the order of uh, uh, 0.05. And so therefore, I simply write down VOL here and say VTH is approximately zero. And I get uh, VS minus uh, VTH. And this is approximately five. Okay, so uh, let me just say this is approximately. Okay, and uh, if you do it, you will get 1.6 picoseconds. Okay, and again, just for fun, let me write the corresponding RC time constant for the circuit, which is RTH CGS. So RTH is approximately 10 ohms, and CGS is one uh, picofarad, so this is one picosecond. Okay, so um, now you'll understand why I've been writing this time constant down. It turns out that the time constant is a very, very important number. So the CNRC circuit, and you compute its time constant uh, for a RLC con connection like this, it's uh, the series resistance times the capacitor. The time constant is a very important number, okay? And for, and usually the circuit delays are in the neighborhood of the time constant value. Okay, in this case, this is one picosecond, that's 1.6 picoseconds. And in this case, um, we had 0.1 nanoseconds and 0.16 nanoseconds. Okay, so the time constant itself is a good indicator of what the delays are going to be like. Okay, so if you have no time, you know, you're, you're, you're sloshing your cereal down in the morning and you need to know how long, you know, for the delay of the inverter is very quickly, you have three seconds, boom, just do the RC, and that's a good, you know, a good first approximation. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do next in the last five, uh, three or four minutes is um, um, set up a little demo for you for uh, your uh, recitation, and then uh, your recitation will cover it. Okay, so this is a true story. Okay, this really, really happened. So in this West Coast school, okay, and, and uh, which shall remain nameless, okay, they had a chip. They built a chip, okay? And the chip had a bunch of pins, as you might imagine. And you know, the pin, as you have a trace on a board, a wire on a board, there is some capacitance attached to wires between the wire and ground. And that's the capacitance, I just call it the load capacitance. It could have been uh, 0.1 puff or you know, 0.01 puff or something like that, okay? So uh, what they found when they built this chip, what they found was that the voltage here they expect it to look like this, you know? But the, this, uh, computer science abstraction and so on, zero to one transition, boom, it should look like this. But for the reasons we saw today, the observed transition was much slower and looked like this. So the student said, aha, let's speed up this chip. Okay, we can speed up the chip by looking at the RL and R on of my driving inverters. And if I make RL small, uh, notice if I make RL small, my delay is small. Okay, if I make R on small, my falling delay is small. So let's make really small RLs R on, and all, let's all have fun. Okay, so uh, unfortunately what they observed was that by making RL and R all both small, the RC time constant small, they expected to see a much sharper rise time. But, and this was the original, but what really happened was they expected this to get faster and kind of look like this, but what happened was disaster struck, okay? What they observed was something like that. This is, this is a real life story. And uh, instead of so getting something like this, they got something like this, and why is that a problem? That's a problem because notice when I expect to be at a zero, I got some spikes that went higher than VIL into the forbidden region, okay? And did bad things to me. So let me show you a little demo and uh, show you that that's exactly how the circuit is behaving. Maybe you can switch to that. Okay, so, uh, so notice that uh, uh, this is what I expect, but this is what I see. Look at the purple uh, curve here. Okay, notice these spikes that are showing up there. This is true, they saw it happen. 
Okay, and why is this happening? So it turns out that what was happening was that the two pins, okay, the two pins were next to each other. And I'll show you a little demonstration here, and let's see if you can figure out why this was happening. So you want to show the, uh, so uh, think of these as two pins. And the pins are close together. I'm just modeling the two pins with a roll of wire. And what I'm going to do is, yes. Now I'm going to separate the wires and keep them far apart. It's like keeping my pins far apart. Hey, guess what happened? Those nasty spikes went away. But then if I, I can't keep my pins a meter apart on a chip. <laughs> Your laptops are going to look, you know, what, 20 yards long. You want, the, you want the pins to be very close to each other, you know, so that you can have many pins on your chips and therefore have very small systems. But then look, I get those spikes. So any idea what's, what's going, why is that happening? Why is it that when the pins are close together, I get those spikes? Let's switch to this. Any ideas? Somewhat? Ah, we just learned about capacitors. So this must have to do with capacitors. There is this parasitic capacitor between the pins. Exactly. Here's what's happening. So here's what I expect. I expect a nice square wave at the output. But instead, I have a pin next to me, and I have a faster waveform driving it. And so therefore, there's a, par there's a parasitic capacitor here. And because of that, I get something called crosstalk. And the model for crosstalk is some resent resultant resistance with the, drive with the parasitic capacitor. And I get those spikes. And in, at the 6002 experts saw the solution. So how do we fix this problem? So 6002 experts said the way we fix this problem is that slower may be better. Instead of having sharp transitions, let me drive it with slower transitions. Okay, let's switch to the demo again. And you will see in recitation, I'm showing the demo very quickly. So I have uh, a sharp transition at the input, which is a yellow thing out there. I'm going to make the transition slower. Switch to a triangular wave, and you'll notice the, transition, the spikes go away. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. The yellow one, there you go. The moment I switch to a slower transitions, boom, the spikes go away. I'm going to switch back to square. There you go. The 6002 experts saw the solution. OK, slower transitions. And you will see, uh, do this example in detail in section tomorrow. Thank you. Yes.